And welcome to another exciting lecture in our Introduction to TV Production class. I, as always, am your host slash lecturer slash professor slash teacher slash ultimate guru, right? Okay, yeah. You can laugh at me. It's okay. I can't hear you. But of course, I'm Dave Harris. And you're welcome to clap if you want. I'll just pretend you're doing that so that it gets me pumped up. Thanks, John. John here in the studio, he's clapping. I can hear him. It's getting me pumped up for television production. Today, we're going to talk about studios, master control, and support areas. We're going to discuss some elements of studios that make them manageable, that make them conducive to television production. We're going to talk about master control and what that's all about in a television production facility or a broadcast facility. And we're going to talk about the various support areas that are involved in television production. The first thing I want to talk about is the studio. Ideally, a studio is going to be as large as possible. And of course, just like in the last lecture, the more sizable things are, the more technically challenging things are in a television studio, the more expensive they're going to be. So here we have Studio B in the Community Education Channel facilities. This is the Green Studio or uh, the Chroma Key Studio. And as we pan to the right, you'll notice the space is as large as possible. We're going to talk about things like the ceiling and how, and how high the ceiling is. But it's really just easier to use larger spaces. And so you always want to have a large studio when it comes to television production. Also in a studio, we're going to look down. We're going to look at the floor. The floor in a studio, like in here in Studio B, is going to be made of concrete. It's going to be solid. It's going to be level. It's going to be as flat as possible with as few seams or cracks as possible as well. Because the cameras are going to be rolling around on that floor and every little tiny minute crack is going to show up as the camera rolls around and even possibly make sound as the camera rolls around on the floor. So you wanna have a nice, hard, flat, level, concrete floor in a studio. That gives you the most to work with. And as you'll notice, this floor is painted black except in the area where it needs to be green. And that's to keep down on reflections from the lighting as the lighting lights up the various spaces. So that's the floor. The next thing we wanna do is look up. Look up to the ceiling, because the ceiling in a studio needs to be as high as possible, because you can imagine it's easier to get lighting instruments or lighting uh, pieces lower to the ground based on the ceiling. You can, you can hang them on poles that get them lower to the ground, but it is absolutely impossible to get the lighting up higher if you're at the top of the ceiling. You have a limited space the lower the ceiling is. And so you'll wanna have a nice high ceiling in the studio space. It allows you room for the lighting. It allows for better lighting. It also gives you room to put things like microphones on large boom poles. Uh, gives space for that. So you have the microphones, you have the lighting, you have a nice high ceiling that gives you a lot of things to work with. And then also it provides you with heat control as well. As we all know from maybe seventh or eighth grade science, heat rises. And so the higher the ceiling is, the more you're going to get that heat that's generated in the studio settling on the ceiling as opposed to down on the floor. I also wanna draw your attention to the walls of the studio space, especially those in Studio B. Studio B has nice large curtains, as you can see here. There's a blue curtain on the one wall and there's a black curtain on the other wall. As you can imagine, flat walls generate a lot, a lot of echo. And in order to control that echo, because echo is bad, you want to have curtains to absorb that. Now, sometimes it's not feasible to have curtains, especially if you're going to be on a set like the one where I'm standing. It's impossible for me to put curtains back behind me because we want to see the set. And so you can, you can kind of hear some echo, and I can hear it myself, and you're probably hearing it in the microphone. There's going to be a little bit of echo, but the more dead fabric area, the more curtains you have, the less echoey sound you're going to get, the better the sound is going to get for your television production. Speaking of sound, I wanna talk about the air conditioner. You may not think about things like air conditioning when you're in a television studio, but as I said earlier, television studios will generate a lot of heat. 
based on the people who are in the studio, based on the lighting and so forth. They will generate a lot of heat. And heat is bad, it causes people to sweat. You can see this little bit of shine right here on the top of my dome, right here on the top of my skull that's being reflected because of the little bit of sweat that's being generated by the heat in this studio. And so if we can con control the heat, make it so that it's not as hot, you'll control the sweat. It'll also be more comfortable for all who are involved in the television production. In order to control that heat, you can think or imagine that air conditioning is going to be employed. Well, the problem with air conditioners is they generate noise, and noise is not good for television productions. If you're hearing me talk, and all the while the microphone is picking up the low rumble of an air conditioner, then that is not going to be a good thing. So you have to understand that in a good television studio, you're going to have a nice, quiet air conditioner that can get rid of the heat, make it nice and cool in that space, but not generate a ton of sound, because sound is a bad thing for a studio. I also want to talk about the doors. Now, I don't have any shots of the doors in this particular television studio, but generally you'll find television studios having nice, thick doors, and inside the metal parts of the door, you're going to have insulation of some sort, some sort of sound-absorbing insulation in, front of the, in between the door panels, and that will allow for less sound to get, to get in, to bleed in through the door opening. Extraneous sound is not a good thing. If I'm shooting a, a production like what we're doing here, and every few minutes you hear an airplane go overhead, but you can't hear it, then it bothers you, it bothers the viewer, and it will mess up your audio. And so you want to have nice thick doors to make sure you keep the sound out. It's all about sound control, it's all about lighting control, it's all about control. And you will hear that over and over again over the course of the semester. When you're shooting television production or a video production of any sort, it is all about control. You need to become a control freak. You need to say to yourself, I want to have this be perfect, and if I'm going to have it perfect exactly like I want it, I want to have control. Control the sound, control the lighting, control the temperature, control, control, control. So it's all about control in a studio space. Having said that, it's always better to bring a production into a studio, if at all possible. When you watch television productions on television, you will note that it is uh, taking place in a studio, although it looks like it's taking place in the world, because in a studio, it is all about control. I now want to move on to some of the major installations in the studio. I actually have a wide shot in our CEC control room here. There's Corey, he's running the, the switcher. He's the technical director, if you'll recall. And some of you students have had an opportunity to work that switcher in past classes here in the, uh, in the intro to TV production class. If you'll notice, and Corey's gonna go ahead and point to the intercom. The intercom there that you can see, maybe John, I don't know if you can possibly maybe zoom in on that. He has a very limited space in there. We were able to just barely squeeze that camera into the doorway. And so he just has just a limited amount of space. But if you look to the left now, that is the intercom. There are four channels on this particular intercom. You can see that one of the channels, the left one, is lit up right now. That enables Corey to use his headset to talk to John. He can also arm or talk to the other channels by simply pushing the button. He'll quickly push and release it. If he were to hold the button down, it's a push to talk, and when he lets go, the button goes dark and you're not talking anymore. So there's two ways to push the buttons on the intercom. You can push it and release very quickly, which will lock the channel on, or you can alternatively push and hold the channel, and then when you let go, it will go dark and you will no longer be talking. Now, those are to talk on the intercom channels. Above those white buttons are black buttons. Those are push to listen buttons, and they only have one way of working. You either, they're either on or they're off. Uh, you're either going to listen to that intercom channel or you're not going to listen to that intercom channel. What four channels of intercom allow you to do is have one channel, say, dedicated to talking to the technical crew, the camera operators, the audio personnel, the video playback personnel. You could also have another channel devoted to talking to the talent. Now, go ahead and come back to camera here, Corey, because I have got something important to tell you. I've told you it's all about the doctrine, it's all about the vocabulary, and I've just used another one, the talent. The talent 
are the people who are, are actually appearing on camera. And now there are many, many jokes as to how talented the talent actually are. And in my case, you might think, well, this guy has no business being on camera. He's not talented at all. How can he call himself the talent? Well, unfortunately or fortunately for me, when I appear on camera, talented or not, I am the talent. And so Corey or any other director or any portion of the technical crew, a producer, for example, can use one of the intercom channels to speak directly to the talent while the talent are currently recording, uh, for example, this type of program or any other television program. A lot of times it's using an earpiece, a small earpiece with a small cable that runs along the back of the ear, back to the back collar, and then down through a cable or to a wireless transmitter or receiver. And the, uh, the talent can be spoken to live. They can hear things in that little earpiece. They can understand what needs to happen live. I don't have that particular earpiece because I'm just kind of wild. I just do whatever I want. I don't like to be told what to do, I guess. But uh, that little earpiece, incidentally, or any other type of device that's used to talk to the talent is called an IFB. IFB, or for interruptible fullback, that allows the people in the control room, like where Corey is sitting, to talk to the talent and have it not be picked up through the microphones. You can imagine if there was just a speaker and they were talking to me through the speaker, it would be picked up by this microphone. So that's the way of talking to the talent. It's interruptible fullback. All right, let's go back to that shot of the control room and the intercom. You can see that there is an intercom box located right there next to the switcher. That would be for the crew member that is operating the switcher, the technical director. There would also be intercom boxes located throughout the studio, as well as in various places in the control room. You generally will have people who are involved in the production having access to the intercom. I want to also show you this small intercom box. This intercom box, it has a cable that will plug into the bottom. It can also have a cable that can run out of the back of, or the bottom of the box to run to other intercoms. But what this is is just a very simple push button intercom. I can place this on my belt right here, have a headset that runs up to my ear, and I can walk around the studio and have access to the intercom. People on the technical crew can talk to me, and I can push the button and talk to them. This is called a belt pack, a belt pack. Belt, and it's a packed intercom system. So you have a belt pack. So with the intercom, you have the ability to talk to the technical crew, you have the ability to talk to the talent through IFB. You also have the ability to talk to various technical personnel in the studio by means of these belt packs. I want to give you a couple of other names for the intercom. You'll hear it called also a PL. In other areas of the United States, there are other words to designate some of these things. Uh, and you'll hear the word PL being used to describe the intercom quite often. PL, uh, for party line, it actually means party line. I don't expect you to know what that one means necessarily, but I would expect you to understand that PL is something that refers to the intercom. On the intercom as well, there will be one last button, and the button would be marked Stage Announce. Stage Announce is a button that can be pushed by the operator of that intercom and have the audio come out through the studio, through various, through speakers that are located in the studio. So if you're in between takes, uh, it doesn't matter that the sound from the director is going to be heard by the microphone for any reason. They can use the stage announce button and do essentially an all call to anybody who happens to be in the studio at that particular time. That's called a stage announce. Let's go ahead and take that shot now of the control room. And you'll note the number of monitors in that control room. As I walk off the set to move this belt pack back into the shelf, you can see that Although I'm not live on screen, you can see that camera. I can wave at you. Hi, here I am. In the preview monitor, as you'll recall from a previous uh, uh, get-together on this class. So on the preview monitor, we have what we see coming up next. The program monitor we talked about numerous times last lecture. Uh, but you'll also see there are many other monitors on that monitor wall. Some of them at the moment are blue because there's no inputs to them. But each of those monitors can be assigned a source of video. It could be cameras, it could be video playback devices, it could be graphics generators or character generators. 
Uh, it can be the live channel thing, which actually you can see in the upper left-hand corner of that shot is what's going out live on the television channel. Video monitors are indispensable in a television production facility. You can never have too many video monitors. When one breaks down, you've got another one to take its place. When you've got something in a specific configuration and you want it in a different configuration, meaning you want to see things in different areas of the monitors, you can assign those monitors very different things. So in a television production facility, in the studio, as well as in the control room, you're going to have many, many monitors, video monitors. It's difficult to see as well in that shot, but there are also audio monitors. There are speakers uh, that are uh, giving Corey, in this case, uh, what he's hearing, which is my microphone. He's able to see that. Yep, John's gonna go ahead and push in on the audio monitor. It's up there in the upper right-hand corner. Here it comes, and there it is. Go ahead and pull focus there, John. There it is, beautiful. There is the audio monitor. You may be you may want to call it a speaker, but you could call it an audio monitor and we'd be okay with that. Uh, you could call it a speaker, you could probably get away with it, but uh, generally you're going to find that we're gonna call those monitors, just like we have video monitors, we're also going to have audio monitors, i.e. those speakers. All right, let's go ahead and take this shot of me again. Here I am, giving you the two thumbs up. And I know John, our camera operator, who's running three cameras in three different rooms, is now going to walk over to the other camera because we're going to talk about lighting and electricity now in a studio configuration. When it comes to electricity, I don't want you all to become electrical engineers in this class. That's not the purpose of the class. It would be nice but unfortunately, I don't have the background to teach you electrical engineering. I only have a limited knowledge about electricity. But I can tell you that in a studio, you want to have as much electricity as possible because lighting takes up a lot of power. It uses a lot of power. A lot more power than you would generally have in your home. The um, normal configuration in your home, if you were to plug uh, something like a vacuum into the outlet in your home, you're going to have uh, access to 100, 110 volts at probably the vacuum is probably maybe using three amps, something like that. Now, these are probably new terms to you. They're, they're describing electricity. And we're going to talk about these a little bit more over the course of the semester. But allow myself to tell you at this point in the semester that you uh, essentially in a studio have about three times that much in terms of voltage available to you and you have significantly more amps available to you in the studio as well, where a vacuum might draw three amps and you might be using like a 20 amp uh, set of power or plugs. In a studio, you're going to have more like 100 amps or 300 amps or even 500 amps available to you. The more power, the better. We're gonna go ahead and take this shot now that shows the, uh, the power distribution center here in the CEC studios. If you look on the right-hand side, you can see those cables that are colored black, red, blue, white, and green, those cables that are plugged into that power distribution area. That gray box that those are plugged into is called a power disconnect. It allows for a source of power. You can imagine those cables being like the plug you would plug into a standard outlet like the one you actually see in that shot on the right-hand side. But each of those plugs, the black, the red, and the blue, are each handling 100 amps of power at 110 volts. There's three of them, which gives you access to even more volts. There's more amps coming out of each one. And then the white one and the green one are neutral and ground cables that are necessary for the electricity. Allow myself to say, to summarize, that you require much power in a television production studio, and you will plug into that power using these types of plugs. We won't talk about what they're called at this point. But as, as he pulls back out now, that black box that says sensor on it is a, it's called a dimmer pack. A dimmer pack, which is where all the lighting plugs into that power distribution center. You can think of each one of those white shelves as being a separate control device for the lighting in the studio configuration. Each light can be on its own circuit using each one of those white shelves. Each one is called a pack inside that dimmer pack. So you can imagine uh, that that's probably something you don't wanna go near. We keep it behind a locked door because that could knock your face off. 
<laughs> All right, and that's one thing. Go ahead and come back to me. I wanna, I wanna tell you, studios in general are not dangerous places. As long as you are being safe, we're going to be working with electricity, we're going to be working with lighting, and some of the light bulbs can get very hot, they can burn you, they can start fires if we're not careful as well. And fire is not something we like to have in a television studio. I don't know if I need to put that in a different way. Fire is bad. I might put that on a test, right? Fire equals bad. Fire is a bad thing, and getting electrocuted, probably equally bad as well. So if you're working with electricity and you're not sure what you're doing, you shouldn't be working with electricity, all right? If you need help, come and talk to me, come and talk to the other members of the CEC staff. When we get into lighting this semester and when we start working with electricity, you will note my preference toward you acting safely as opposed to learning by electrocuting yourself. That is not a good way to learn. I've tried it, it learning by electricity, it just doesn't work. I'm kidding, I, I've never electrocuted myself on purpose. It's never, never been that way. But be safe in the studio. Lots of power coming in, we're using lots of power. I don't want you all to get hurt. And so be very careful. We talked about last time about the switcher, the video switcher. We're going to have an entire lecture devoted to video switching. We're also going to have an entire lecture video uh, uh, dedicated to lighting, as well as one dedicated to audio. One element of the television studio that I do want you to note is something called engineering. With engineering, you have control over the cameras. You're able to paint the cameras. You're able to open irises. You're able to make them more blue or more red or more yellow or something like that. You can see that the, this camera looks fantastic. My face is just glowing with wonderful skin tones. And that's because the camera has been properly engineered in the room called engineering. I don't want to show you this room just yet because uh, we're going to dedicate more time to it and it's actually quite intense. Uh, but sufficeth us to say in this beginning lecture that there is an area called engineering. The last section I want to talk about is in a broadcast television facility. It's called master control. Master control is where all the various video feeds from any number of control rooms within that television studio or any other feeds coming from, say, a network like NBC or CBS or Fox or CNN or something like that. All of these various video feeds coming in through satellite systems, through other broadcast systems, through control rooms in various areas within the studio facility or the television facility, they will all come to this one place called master control. Master control is where the operator of master control, called the master control operator, incidentally, will make the decision as to what actually goes out to broadcast, what actually goes out to air. And it's essentially the last look, that's the last video monitor and the last audio monitors before it heads out to go to wherever it's going to go within the city, to your living room or to your electronic device or whatever it might be. Master control is the last decision point as to what actually goes out to air. It also is a place where various feeds can be recorded. So for example, if we have uh, news like KUTV News, KUTV may be recording feeds that are coming in from other broadcast partners like CBS or CNN. A master control operator may be the one who's recording those things to be distributed within the television system. So it's kind of like the main area where main, the main decisions are being made as to what's actually going out to air and what is being recorded for later broadcast. It's also an area where you're going to have lots of storage area, large disk drives, lots of computers to store various things. You'll probably even have some videotapes, probably even some old school videotapes like VHS and Beta that are stored in master control. They try and keep copies of everything that goes out to air as much as possible so that they can prove to people like advertisers that their advertisements actually ran. So you can imagine there's lots of video storage areas in master control. There's also lots of playback devices in master control so that they can playback video from any number of different sources. Master control is a cool place. One of these days in, a, in an upcoming class, I'm going to show you CEC's master control area and talk to you just a little bit about what master control is all about. That was a short lecture today. They all get like that sometimes. 
We talked about studios. We talked about what's important in studios being, especially the large space, the, lar the nice concrete, hard, flat level floor, high ceilings, the curtains to control sound. We also talked about the control room, the intercom. We talked about power and power distribution and how we want to stay safe. And lastly, we talked about master control in this lecture. As always, if you have questions, I would invite you to type those questions out. Raise your hand with your keyboard. Type your question out. Send it to me via Canvas. Or if you prefer to talk in person, you can wait until we meet in person. But I do expect to have questions. If we were live, you would raise your hand. I expect there to be questions, even though we're not live. I'm available via Canvas. I'm available via any other means we've talked about in the past. If you have any questions, do let me know. And we'll see you on the next lecture.